long suffering satchel thumped rhythmically against Holly's knees as she walked through the pale frosted city. It was early and the bricks at the very tops of the houses were touched with the colors of the sunrise. Delighted with the crisp air, the slippery ice beneath her feet and the exhilaration of freedom, Holly broke into a short run. Abruptly, she stopped and skid along the frozen bricks, startling several pigeons and Tundra, who was still sleepy. Excuse me, Holly laughed at the birds, who replied with offended coos. You should be up anyway. It's a beautiful morning. Oops, Holly neatly skirted a large, tired-looking man who was scattering sawdust on the ice. Hey, he yelled, watching her go. Ain't you kind of big to be sliding around? You're never too old for sliding, she called back to him, skidding along the sidewalk. He guffawed and made a tiny slide himself. Putting down the bag of sawdust, he made a more determined run and slide. Loony, he said, looking after Holly with a grin. On she went, a trio of shop girls hurrying anxiously to one of the great department stores on the Ladies' Mile, caught sight of Holly's gliding figure and smiled at one another. Then one of the three, the youngest, gave a little push and slid herself. After an exchange of glances, the others followed, and three faces that had been stiff with worry and haste melted into something better. Still sliding, Holly passed into the neighborhood on lofty mansions and graceful chateau imported stone by stone from France. Now she could see the lacy treetops of the park, and she slowed and called over her shoulder, Race you, Tundra! First one to Miguel Henny's gets a sausage. Tundra snorted scornfully. Holly stuck out her tongue at him. Scared you'll lose, she teased. In answer, Tundra leaped and bolted. Head down, he skimmed across the pavement and suddenly veered across the broad expanse of Fifth Avenue and into the park. He could hear Holly laughing and panting behind him, but in the ecstasy of running, he flew faster, his paws scarcely touching the icy ground. He raced on madly until he realized that the only sound he could hear was the light crunch of his own paws in the snow. He stopped dead, rolling into a crouch, and waited. Nothing. Only his own panting breath. Where was she? He cursed himself and leapt to his feet. If he had run fast before, it was nothing to his pace now. He streaked over a gentle inc incline and across the snowy lawn, retracing his steps until he reached the south tip of the mall, where he saw her, a small figure flapping, the s flapping along the snow-covered walk with a bulging bag in her arms. Relief streamed through him, and when he could breathe again, he loved to meet her. Show off, she cried when he came into hearing range. I'm sorry, he replied sincerely. Are you all right? Yes, of course. Why wouldn't I be? She answered with surprise. Holly, doesn't it ever occur to you that this place could be dangerous? What, the mortals? He hated to say it. Not the mortals. Comprehension dawned in her eyes. I know. I mean, I know you are right when you say that there is danger here. Heracon is more likely to try to find me here than at home, she said slowly, as though learning a lesson. But Tundra, her voice dropped to a whisper, I just can't feel it. I can't believe in it. I don't know why exactly, but it seems impossible that I should be the center of this struggle. How can I be that important? I feel none of it. That's because you have the heart untouched by pride or greed or self-interest. You're exactly what he wants. But Tundra didn't say any of that because it would do no good. What he did say was, come on, let's go deliver some dolls. Holly's troubled face cleared and her eyes, the color of the sea and the storm, lightened. Yes, let's do that. The snowy paths were beginning to fill with the day's pedestrians, wrapped to their eyes against the bite of the cold. Holly and Tundra walked sedately toward the mall, trying to look like an average young lady with an extremely lumpy bag, no coat to speak of, and a large snow-white dog. Yet several curious glances followed them. Soon enough, Holly veered off the path, and they lost themselves in the scrubby forest that lay west of the Great Avenue. They had reached the place. 
Again, Holly saw the embers of the poor fire at the center of the encampment, but now, around its dying warmth, lay four heaps of blankets, each with a thin crust of snow on top. Three of the mounds were still sleeping, but the fourth wiggled as Holly and Tundra approached. A moist black nose poked out, withdrew, and poked out again. Sidewalk, Holly whispered, and the dog squirmed out from beneath the blankets and greeted her with a wagging tail. Hello, friend, she whispered. Is everybody still asleep? I've brought some bread for you. She reached into the bag and pulled out a lump of bread, which Sidewalk ate with gusto. Abruptly, one of the blankets... <laughs> One of the blanket rolls sat up. It was Jeremy. Some watchdog, he said to Sidewalk. Hi, good morning, he said to Holly and Tundra. What you doing here? I brought some breakfast, said Holly, and some dolls. Bring them for Lissy, asked Jeremy. Yes, of course, answered Holly. How is she? Not so good. When I come back last night, she was coughing something awful. She didn't take much to eat either. Said she wasn't hungry. She shouldn't be outside in this weather, said Holly. Then I went. I told her she got to go to the poorhouse or the children's aid, but she says no. She says they'll lock her up and she'd rather die out here with us. Jeremy passed his hand across his eyes. I don't know what to do. From inside the little shack came the sound of a racking, gluey cough that seemed to go on and on. It was followed by small rustles and groans as the layers of children within awoke to a new day. The first to emerge was Bat, in dire need of a handkerchief, but still a cheering sight to Holly, for he looked rested and reasonably well fed. Hot in there, he said. Oh, Holly's here. Hi, Holly. He bounced over to her and looked up, confident of his welcome. He got it. She kissed his dirty cheek, wiped his nose, and offered him some bread and milk. The smell of fresh bread invaded the sleeper's dreams, and soon more children straggled out of the hay-filled shack to greet Holly and enjoy the rare experience of having full belly in the morning. Bruno and Marty, the two biggest boys, built the fire up, careful not to get large enough to attract notice, and the children lounged around on the few dry patches of ground or on logs. Finally, Lissy, too, emerged from the wooden shack, holding Joan's hand. Holly saw the dark smudges around her eyes and a feverish color in her cheeks. She and Jeremy exchanged glances. Good morning, dear, she said to the girl. Come sit here by the fire. Slowly, slowly, Lissy walked to the spot Holly had indicated, her eyes fixed intently on the flames. She dropped down with a sigh of exhaustion, and when she reached it, she dropped down with a sigh of exhaustion when she reached it, and Holly quickly swung two blankets around her thin shoulders and leaned the girl back against the log. Are you cold? she asked, handing Lissy a cracked cup of milk. Cold? Lissy repeated vaguely. I don't think so. No, I'm warm. She drank the milk. I brought you something. Lizzie turned her head. Um, that's them. She lapsed into silence. Do you want it? Asked Holly, puzzled. What? Oh, I forgot. Yes. Holly reached into her satchel and brought forth the doll. She laid it in Lizzie's lap. What is it? Said Lizzie. Slowly, her vague gaze seemed to focus on the little figure that lay in her lap. She stared for a long time at the face with its coiled brown hair and smooth pink cheeks. It's my ma, she said hoarsely. How did you know what she looked like? I didn't. It's, it's not, Holly broke off, unsure of the right way to answer. I didn't know I was making your mother, she said finally. I thought I was making you. You made it? Yes. Lizzie's eyes traveled down to Holly's long fingers and rested there. You made it? Holly smiled. Yes, I thought I was making you all grown up, well and happy. I thought that would be your dream. For the first time, she saw Lizzie smile. I'm not going to grow up and be well and happy. But if you was making their dreams, you made it right. 
I dream about my mom all the time. Is your mama dead? A long time ago when I was six or something. But I remember how she looked before she got sick and it was like this. Lucy drew a rattling back breath and continued. After she was dead, I kept looking and looking for her because nobody told me what dead was. I thought she had just run away. I thought she was mad at me or something. Then I found out and I stopped looking. But now I catch myself watching for her again. Yesterday at Miguel Henny's, I saw a lady in a brown coat walking kind of brisk, and I thought, that's her, that's mom. Lucy lifted the doll's little arms. Stupid, wasn't it? But now here she is. She cradled the doll against her neck. Holly reached out and held the little girl. This world is so hard, she whispered. There's some good parts, Lucy answered. This morning is good. This milk is good. Seeing my ma here in the stall is good. She loved me. Holly didn't reply. Instead, she drew forth the rest of the dream dolls from her satchel. Look, Bat, she called to the little boy who was even dirtier now than he had been ten minutes before. Look, it's you. She held up the figure dressed in bright silk shirt. Hey, Bat shouted. It's me, but bigger and fancier. Look at me. He grabbed a little figure and danced it around in the air. The other children crowded around him curiously. I'll be jiggered. It even has that scar on your head. What you got on there, Bat silk underwear? Nah, said Marty authoritatively. That's horse racing clothes, that is. You gonna be a horse racer, Bat? Bat's face lit with joy. A horse racer? You mean you get to sit on the horses while they run? Oh, sure, said Marty, enjoying himself. It's even a job. You can get paid for it. People bet money on horses, and whoever wins gets a big pile of scratch. I've seen it. Bat's eyes grew round, and he stared at the doll version of himself reverently. A horse racer, he breathed. It's a job. Jeremy grinned. If you don't get squished on the mall first, that's why he was out there yesterday morning, he explained to Holly. He's crazy for horses. Now the other children crowded around Holly, demanding and receiving their dream dolls. If their manners lacked some finesse, their appreciation of their gifts made up for it in Holly's eyes. They understood intuitively that these figures were not portraits, but somehow models of their inner selves and their hopes. They seemed to take strength from the sight of them, staring thoughtfully at the small faces as if storing them in their memories. Holly saw more than one child tuck the figure carefully into a worn inner pocket, then pull it back out for one more look. The younger children, Johnny, Jim, Sue, and Mel, began to play house with their new toys, which Holly found touching, given the probability that not one of them had ever even lived in a real house. We better go, Holly, said Jeremy after a while. He walked over to a fresh patch of snow and cleaned his face with a handful. I'm ready. As Holly gathered her bundle, she felt a small tug on her skirt. It was Bat. You coming back? He asked. I'll see you before I leave, she replied. You're leaving? When? cried two or three startled children. Christmas Eve, tomorrow night. Jeremy turned away, suddenly very busy with his shoes. From her nest of blankets, Lucy said, Promise you'll come back one more time. I promise, Holly said. There was another tuck on her skirt. Give me a kiss, commanded Bat. Holly knelt to obey, wrapping her arms around the little boy's sturdiness. You can go, he said, not looking at her. Oh, Bat, I love you said Holly, giving him an extra squeeze. He grunted in reply, but his neck turned red. Come on, Holly, we're gonna be late, urged Jeremy. They flew through the streets, sliding and laughing with Tundra trotting behind and reached the toy shop as Mr. Kleiner did. His worry frown eased at the sight of them. There you are, he called happily. I was beginning to think yesterday was only a dream. As they entered the door, the snow began to fall lightly 
adding a dazzle to the Christmas marvels that filled the shop. Tundra took up his corner, which offered the advantage of overseeing both the shadowy staircase to the upper floor and the front door, through which he expected Hunter Hartman to arrive any minute. Mr. Hartman, however, seemed to be less than punctual, and Tundra closed his eyes, trying to convince himself that he was ready for a nap. But when the store bell jingled for the first time that day, he leapt to his feet in an instant. To his disappointment, a middle-aged man, darkly bearded, entered the store with three boys trailing behind him. Now, said the man with expectant pleasure. He looked around and rubbed his hands together. We'll surely find what we seek here. By Jove, they've rigged up some stage snow. How ingenious. What's it made of? Charles, what's it made of? Holly, eager to distract the, from this line of questioning, wrestled forward and then came to a sudden halt. Charles, she cried, Jerome and Harris too. How glad I am to see you again. She held out her hands and the three boys ran into her arms. You never told us you had a toy store, Jerome said enviously. It's not mine, she said laughing. I work here. Don't you wish you did? Yes, the three shouted. I could work here, Harrison announced. I could climb the shelves and put the toys on. So you could, said Holly, giving him a squeeze. I'd hire you in a minute, too, except that it isn't my store. Charles, a gentleman must introduce his acquaintances, his father prodded. Father, Char said Charles proudly, I'd like to introduce you. He stopped, warned by his father's waggling eyebrows that something was wrong. What? Customly permission, advised his father in a stage whisper. He smiled at Holly, who smiled back. Charles appeared flummoxed by this hint. Oh, he said finally. Holly, will you permit me to introduce you to my father? Certainly, said Holly. Holly, this is my father, Dr. Bronzels. Father, this is Miss Holly Claus. Most pleased to meet you, Miss Claus, said Dr. Bronzels with a bow. And I you, Dr. Bronzels. Charles, with some assistance from Jerome and Harrison, was explaining to his father just how he knew Holly. She fell over in the snow. Bang, not like a young lady at all, Harrison said admiringly. An excellent quality to be sure, said Dr. Bronfels with a friendly smile. Most young ladies are far too particular about their clothes to take the exercise that is so necessary for their health. You believe in fresh air and exercise, sir? Asked Holly. An idea was beginning to take shape in her mind. Yes, particularly for young people. Exercise, no less nourishing than food and restful sleep, is vital for health and growth. Our children are nervous and debilitated due to... Father, whispered Harrison loudly. Father, don't start talking about corsets, please. Dr. Brunfels ruffled his son's hair. All right, Harrison, I'll stop. Aren't we here to find Christmas presents for your sister's boys? He clapped his hands together. What shall it be? Jerome, who had been poking about in a low shelf, held up a lifelike rubber frog with the sagging rubber tongue. Alice would love this, he said. Dr. Braunfeld shouted with laughter. They'd hear her scream in Brooklyn, Jerome. Come now, think of the girls. What do they wish for? Dolls, said Harrison. He looked glum. Dolls in silk dresses, Jerome sneered. Look at that sled with the steering wheel, Charles sighed. Evie likes to sled, said Harrison, hopefully. No, nah, she doesn't. They all sighed. Dolls. They looked at their father with tragic faces. Dolls, they repeated. Dr. Braunfels patted them on the back. That's the way, boys. That's thinking of others before yourselves, which is also called the Christmas spirit. Very good. Dolls, then, he turned to Holly. This being precisely what she had hoped for, she was prepared. Sir, said Holly, our dolls are so very special that we don't put them on the shelves, but keep them in a safe in but keep them safe in our storeroom for favorite customers. I'd be happy to bring out two dolls for Alice and Evelyn, but you can wait if you can wait for just five minutes. Dr. Braunfeld shrugged. I'm sure the boys will manage to while away for five minutes without much trouble, he said, but Holly was already flying toward the storeroom. Hastily, she removed the porcelain from her satchel and began to work, with Evelyn's face and then Alice's floating through her mind. Once the dolls were finished, she wove them magical silk dresses in her mind. But 
To her surprise, when she turned to the dolls after her reverie, she found that only Alice was dressed in the swishing blue, gown, blue ball gown of her imagination. The small figure that held Evelyn's dream was clothed in a simple white jacket over a plain skirt. Her eyes were clear, even serene, but her mouth was firm. She was, without a doubt, a doctor. Polly brought the dolls out to the front of the shop. Hey, it's Alice and Evie, bellowed Jerome. Look at that, Charles whistled. Look at Evie, said Harrison. What she got on? Dr. Bronfeld looked long and thoughtfully at the dolls he held. And when he lifted his eyes to Holly's, he saw that she saw that he was both troubled and intrigued. It does no good to ask how you managed to make these replicas of my daughters, I expect. That's correct, sir, said Holly. I couldn't explain even if I tried to. This is Alice as she will be, I see, grown to a graceful woman. I'm not surprised, for she is graceful now. But Evelyn, in a doctor's coat? I cannot imagine such a future for her. She cries when she sees someone hurt, Holly interrupted. Surely compassion should be the first qualification of a doctor. Dr. Bronfels gazed at her. True, and yet a woman's heart is too tender for the sights a doctor must endure. I disagree, sir. A tender heart is no liability, provided that its owner also possesses a steady mind and hand. You would not destroy a dream that has been modeled in your own, on your own. <clears throat> you could not, Holly looked earnestly at the doctor, simply because she's not a boy. The boys turned from one the boys turned from one speaker to the other, their mouths agape. But the schools, the associations, Dr. Bronfield said, every possible obstruction will be thrown in her way because she's female. The road is long and nearly impassable. But it is her road, not yours. If knowing its difficulty, she chooses it, chooses it anyway, you have no right to stop her, cried Holly. The doctor smiled. I must say, you are a very argumentative young lady, Miss Claus. Why do you care so much about my envy? Dreams are precious, said Holly. Yes, he said in a low voice. You're right. He stared at the figure for another moment, and it seemed to stare right back at him. Well, boys... I believe we have found the gifts we need. What is the price for these extremely unusual dolls, Miss Claus? This was what Holly had been waiting for. She cleared her throat and plunged in. Sir, I will give you these dolls as a gift. But, she added, seeing Dr. Bronfels ready to protest, I want you to give me a gift in return. And what would that be? He asked cautiously. I have a friend, a little girl, who coughs terribly. She has no money, and so she hasn't seen a doctor. I think, I think she might die soon unless she gets some help. Will you go see her? Dr. Bronfels patted her shoulder sympathetically. Of course, my dear. Tell me where the child lives. He pulled a memorandum book from his pocket. Holly glanced at Jeremy. He nodded. She lives in Central Park, began Holly. She what? She lives with some other children in Central Park. Now, in this weather? Yes, sir. But there are homes. The children's aid home is supposed to provide shelter. She won't go, sir. She doesn't want to be locked up. None of them do. They say it's like jail. If I tell you where she is, you must promise not to reveal her secret. Do you promise? Holly looked at him intently. Dr. Bronfels put away his memorandum book. Yes, I promise, he said, and Holly knew he would keep his word. Jeremy appeared at her side like magic with his cap on his head. I'll take you, he said. I'll take you there right now. We'll need to stop at my home for my bag, but it's not far, near St. Bar Bar Bartholomew's. That's along the way, said Jeremy. Take Evelyn, too, said Holly, suddenly. Pardon, said Dr. Bronfels. Take Evelyn with you. She should meet these children. I'll go too, said Charles. Maybe there's something I can do. I shall be glad of your company, Dr. Bronfeld said to his son and then clapped his hat on his head. Very well, young man, he turned to Jeremy. Let's go. He charged briskly through the door with a doll under each arm. 
Charles and Jeremy followed, and Jerome, with one final longing look at the rubber frog, grabbed Harrison by the hand and pulled him after. Holly watched through the window as they disappeared into the swirl of cages and snow and coats, and then turned back to the quiet store with a small sigh. It was a kind thing you did, said Mr. Kleiner. Holly said nothing. She did not seem to hear him. The bell jingled and they jumped. A pale woman with a cloud of black hair entered the shop and looked inquiringly at the shelves. I heard that wonderful dolls are made here, she began, and before long, Holly was back in the storeroom, quickly man manufacturing a winsome doll for a solemn little girl of ten. Then another mother came in with twins peeking out from behind her skirt. She too had heard tales of marvelous dolls, and so Holly made the twin, twin dolls with shy smiles and devilish hearts. By now the store was humming with customers, as passerbys were lured in by the sight of snow and held by the array of treasures on the shelves. Holly coming from the storeroom with an armful of dolls, and Mr. Kleiner winding up a music box for a curious toddler, exchanged looks of satisfaction. A bevy of little girls knelt before the little town in the glass case, each selecting the house she hoped to live in. A contented baby rocked her new teddy bear while her mother turned the shiny pages of a mother goose book. Between, around, and among the crowds of children were adults taking respite from the cold and crowded streets in the enchanted aisles of the toy shop. Here and there, Holly saw grown-ups who had discovered an old friend, a toy from childhood, and she watched as their eyes grew full of memories. One old man with a face like a hatchet had been caught up in a bright Chinese puzzle for nearly an hour. He simply could not figure out how to unfold the intricate layers of wood that enclosed the tiny paper butterfly within, and each time he thought he was near the prize, he had trapped himself anew. Finally, he stomped over to the counter and slammed the little box down. Guess I'll take it, he snarled, smiling. Mr. Kleiner collected his money, and the groom man turned on his heel. Then he paused. Got any others? he asked. Mr. Kleiner showed him six or seven equally maddening puzzles. Guess I'll take them all. Two hours passed in a matter of moments, and then, in an instant, the flurry was over. The store, which had been thick with people and loud with the clang and rattle of toys, was now empty and silent, except for the ticking of the great-grandfather clock far away in the gloom upstairs. Praise be! I'll rest my weary bones for a minute or two said Mr. Kleiner, easing himself onto a stool. And then you'll get us a Christmas tree, won't you? teased Holly. Miss Claus, you are a tyrant. Oh, Pooh, you have no holiday spirit. You have enough for both of us, Mr. Kleiner laughed. They both became aware of a presence on the gallery above. They looked up uneasily, but the only evidence of Mr. Carroll was the swaying motion of the velvet curtain that shielded the hallway from view. Mr. Kleiner jumped to his feet. Yes, yes, I'll be off for your Christmas tree, back in a jiffy, wrapping himself in an assortment of bright striped scarves that were undoubtedly the work of Mr. Kle Mrs. Kleiner's knitting needles. He darted out the door. Holly glanced around the empty store, expectantly alone and acutely aware of Mr. Carroll breathing, pacing, working, and frowning somewhere above her head. Unconsciously, she tightened the snowflake shawl around her shoulders, as if it would bolster her. Don't be silly, she told herself. This is no time to act childish. I have responsibilities, and Tundra is here to protect me, even if he is asleep. She straightened her shoulders and looked around for something to do. Yes, those masks and crowns could certainly use some tidying. Just as Holly was striding purposefully toward the jumble of feathers and pasteboard, the shop bell tinkled and a timid-looking girl about sixteen edged inside. Her eyes grew large at the spectacle of the dancing snow and the array of toys, and she pressed herself against the refuge of the nearest wall to stare in silence until Holly approached. Then she jumped. Oh, I'm sorry, miss, she gulped. Sorry, Holly said. What for? The girl twisted her hand. Just, just sorry, I guess. Holly smiled into the anxious face before her. You are welcome here. Can I help you find a toy? The girl offered a tiny smile in return. Oh, not for me, miss. I'm just a housemaid. I come to pick up a train set for Mr. Mrs. August Itchbald. 
Mrs. August Inchbald likes to play with trains then? Asked Holly seriously, hoping to coax another smile from the shy face. The girl broke into a surprised grin. Mrs. August Inchbald don't play with trains, miss. She's a grown lady. The train is for her boy, for Christmas.